things in his name. Amen. All righty. <clears throat> so we are looking here uh, at the beginning part still of chapter 4. We're on day 26. Day 26. And if someone could read for me Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 20. Ephesians chapter 6, uh, 10 through 20 of Ephesians 6. It's on page 48 in your book. Uh, if you're looking in the book, and it's Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 to get us started. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand it, to withstand it in the evil day. Having done all to stand, stand therefore, and gird your waist of truth, and put on the breastplate of righteousness, and God receive the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, the Lord of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Through 20. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful within with all perseverance and supplication for all the things, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly. All right, thank you, brother. Um, and so <clears throat> let's ask this first question and answer it together. Why does Paul instruct Christians to put on the whole armor of God? Right, so Satan has tactics. Satan has weapons that he uses. Uh, Satan is lurking, prowling, seeking whom he may devour. And so in order to offset, to battle, to survive that threat, uh, we require the Word of God. We require uh, His armor, which is His Word. And so His Word is necessary in order for us to battle against this new enemy um, that we're discussing. So having done all to stand. Having done all to stand. And that's interesting, and I think we've looked at this before. If you break down the way that this is structured, notice the end of verse 13. And having done all to stand. Stand therefore. I mean, that's interesting. You think about having done all to stand, it might follow with give up. <laughs> having done all to stand, be defeated. Having done all to stand, you tried everything you could, you fall over. You quit. It, it, it can't be endured anymore, any longer. But that's not what's said. Having done all to stand. Once you reach that point of thinking, you've done all to stand. God then says, Stand therefore. Uh, and so we have the tools necessary in order to combat against uh, our, our enemy, our uh, new enemy in, in view of the uh, babe in Christ. And so the prayer starter asked God for courage to withstand temptation. So thinking about how we apply this passage to our individual selves, we use the armor in order to withstand temptation, in order to uh, battle Satan. And we pray um, for this success. But then also, it's interesting, if you look at the very end, verses 18 and uh, 18 through 20, um, he is also not only mindful of your own selves, of your own personal situation, but also for all the saints, the end of verse 18, and also for Paul. Now, we, we don't pray for Paul, but think about Scott Illy. Think about Gary Jones. Think about John Grubb. Uh, think about bucket by bucket, um, Latin American missions and the preachers that are there in Latin America and the, the various works that we have ongoing and the missionaries that we are supporting. Um, uh, think about even our own work here in coming uh, as it relates to the work of our brethren uh, who are engaged in the Spanish demographic, um, Spanish-speaking demographic. So um, pray for ourselves regarding the armor of God praying for all saints regarding the armor of God, praying also for those who are um, 
full-time focused on spreading the gospel, and that is what they are doing. Um, so that, again, brings us to that sensitivity regarding our enemy, his threats, and how we armor, arm ourselves in order to combat against it. Let's read now um, these second set of questions um, for this morning. Day 27, it's the same passage there, so still Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. How is Satan described in these verses? What kinds of weapons does he use? So first off, are we talking about an enemy that we can physically point at and has substance that we can say, there he is? No. Uh, however, the weapons and the method of warfare that he engages in uh, are manifest and are seen, uh, but they are only seen in outcome. They are only seen in the way in which the world is influenced by his working. Uh, and you see there in verse 12, we're, we're not wrestling against um, flesh and blood. Uh, the idea of there being a crusade and the idea of us, you know, going to battle and, and fighting uh, for the cause of the gospel physically, that's, that's not how it works. Um, we are working against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And if we are going to fight and engage in physical warfare, um, on that turf we lose. On that turf we lose. Uh, what, did, what did Jesus say to Peter? Uh, those who raise the sword will die by the sword. So if, if it's, it's really, God is making it clear, if you misunderstand the context of the battle you're fighting, you're going to lose. But if you understand and are sensitive and are living based upon the correct context, which is not the physical, fleshly battle, but it is the spiritual one, guess what? We have victory. We have victory. So we have to define the fight. We have to define the scope in which the argumentation, in which the debate, in which the um, battling takes place. And if we are being tempted to be sucked into the wrong context of the battle, we have to reorient our mind and get back to, wait a second, that's not the battle I'm fighting. That's not my warfare. It's not what I'm engaged in. Um, and just that understanding alone, by the way, uh, <laughs> again, I think this is why this class is relevant for all time periods of our walk as a Christian. Because it's hard enough as a new Christian to understand this, but even when you've been a Christian for decades, it is very challenging to remember, wait a second, that's not the battle that we're fighting. We're fighting this battle. Go ahead. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Sure. Maybe at its core, there's some categories that we can point to that are common, but the ways in which that actually comes out in all our individual lives is different, and we all have different propensities, we have different areas of sensitivity that are particular to us, but not necessarily to another. And again, that speaks to the requirement of this being an individual endeavor, because the preacher, the elders, our brethren aren't going to necessarily be able to speak to our own individual battles that we struggle with personally. But get, guess what can? The Word of God as we apply it to our lives. Uh, because remember what um, the Hebrews writer states in Hebrews chapter 4 regarding the Word of God and its power. Verse 12, um, it is a two-edged sword piercing even the, to, the, to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. If we want to really look at the battle, the battle takes place in the mirror. That's where the battle takes place. That's where all of this goes on. It is within the psyche, within the self-concept of the individual. How is it that I understand myself? How is it that I battle and war? And what is it that can actually give me the knowledge to understand that correctly? God's word. Because I can't know your intents. I can't know what you're struggling with. I can't know what your heart is fixated on. I can judge your fruits. But I can't know what you, what you deal with. But guess what? God, God knows. 
and you know God knows, and God's word is what is used to bring that out. Uh, yeah, excellent, excellent point and thought. Um, let's look at number two here. List the different pieces of the armor of God. How do you think each one is used? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, amen, brother. And if you think about what's required in order to equip us to overcome that, you see the power of his craftiness, his subtleness, his ways. If we require this entire book, um, if we require the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God dying on the cross for mankind, in order to overcome his ways, that his ways are powerful. Don't underestimate them. They are, they're tricks. They're lies. Uh, you can be deceived very easily. Um, and and to, to discount that, to laugh about that, is uh, at our own peril. about the first century, <clears throat> what was happening initially? The church was being persecuted. The world was against the church. Well then, what? Over the next 500 years, the church then slowly but surely became accepted, but what happened? It's not that now all of a sudden the world was guided by the church. The world just then started to leverage the benefits that they saw, quote, in the church to then impose continuously still its will upon the world through denominationalism. And so you've never had a situation. As a matter of fact, some have said there's only been two time frames in all of life when God's people were in the majority. Immediately after creation and immediately after the flood. And that was it. Yeah, amen, brother. Amen. Yep, yep. And, and again, you kind of connecting a little bit Wednesday and seeking. Uh, society is in desperation. And in many ways are seeking for answers. But don't understand that God's wisdom, His word, His love, the gospel, has direction to provide in those answers. What is it that the world is trying to understand? They're trying to understand our relationship with technology. They know it's a problem. Everyone, I mean, even the people who create the technology know it's a problem. 
They're trying to understand mental health and the mental health crisis. They know it's a problem. They're trying to understand young people and their health and their survival. They know it's a problem. Uh, so there's ways in which we can leverage our wisdom and our understanding, our knowledge of God's word, and <clears throat> provide instruction and guidance and continue regardless of what category, what area, what question mark exists to point the world to Christ uh, because he has the answers. Um, and what a blessing uh, that is. Sure. But yeah, David Amber is now Correct. best friend. Correct. Oh, this is the wiles of the devil. Right. Like Amen. Small thing. Amen. And I'm making you feel like everything is going to be dead. No. Yeah. Scripture is scripture. And that's, and that's it. God sets the standard. God sets the foundation. Anything that breaks that foundation or, or that does something different is not of God. Amen. Amen. And from a practicality perspective, probably a lot of people align to what he just described which is the Bible is a waste of time and it is to man's detriment to bog himself down with the particulars. However, practicality, you know, from a uh, attaboy perspective, yeah, there's some great things in the Bible. And you know what? Maybe we should consider some of that. But certainly it has nothing to do with God and the Bible can't be right. Um, so whether or not someone's a renowned evolutionist atheist saying that, or whether or not we talk to the average person across the street or, or you know, down the way, uh, that's generally how I think American society and the current generation views things. Um, and to Larry's point, it's not like, oh, we're right, hey, we're in lockstep with you. That's wonderful. We're making improvements. Uh, no, we just lock ourselves in and ground ourselves into the standard. Oh, okay, Richard Dawkins. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, not, not surprising. Um, that's actually a good, probably, label. <laughs> because that's, I think, again, I think a lot of people would say that. Um, so again, the different pieces of the armor of God. How do we think each one is used? Notice all the pieces that are, that are highlighted. What is it that God's Word protects us in? It protects our mind. It protects our heart. It protects where we go. Uh, it protects every aspect of who we are and how we function. So if we're going in the wrong places, if we're ending up with the wrong friends, if we're engaging in the wrong behaviors, our feet need the gospel. If our mind is constantly venturing into areas where it shouldn't be going and we're constantly being tempted and thinking about things we shouldn't be thinking about, we need the gospel. If we're maybe doing the right things, but our heart is far from God, we're not actually interested in investing and plowing ourselves in and loving and desiring to be with God, we need the gospel. The gospel gives us what we need to offset all these areas and categories of our life. Uh, he mentions here, prayer starter, thank God for his warnings about Satan and sin. Thank him for equipping you with his armor so you can remain faithful 
to him. Uh, communication, speaking, reinforcing it, um, not just uh, an exercise in futility, it is a relationship and an ongoing process in drawing ourselves closer to God, praying about these things. So that's the question. Are we praying about these things? I mean, these prayer starters are not just like niceties. Brother Hatfield's giving us some really good guidance here. Um, and think about your prayer life. I'm thinking about my prayer life. There's lots, I mean, wow. It makes you kind of press pause, right? I can really be doing better and be more detailed and really think about and be more intentional and mindful in my prayer life. Uh, day 28 here, Romans 5, 6 through 11, if someone could read that for me. Romans 5, 6 through 11. Okay, so here's what's interesting. What is this chapter entitled, A New Enemy? Um, prior to being saved, what was our spiritual state? We were lost, we were hopeless. In this context in particular, we were without strength. Notice verse 10. Beginning there, verse 10. Enemies. Um, so, as we think about, you know, these different individuals we're calling out, as we think about our neighbors and our friends, as we think about the need to evangelize and, and just <laughs> how bleak the future looks, um, it, it's actually not bleak, right? It, it's bright. Why? <clears throat> because we can have compassion and empathy rather than being, hey, thou shalt not, let me beat you over the head, the head with the Bible. We can recognize, you know what? <laughs> Prior to my status as a Christian, I was an enemy. I was opposed to God. I was against Him. What did I need? I needed others to love me. I needed to, to recognize and be taught and learn the love that God has for me. I needed to see the extent that He went in order to save me. When I was opposed to Him and against Him and an enemy of His. And so that then shifts the thought process rather than it being a you know irritability as we engage with others it is a tenderness of longing uh, that we can relate to that we can understand um, so again just thinking about you know our new enemy and a, a new enemy um, orienting ourselves to the fact that you know what we were enemies uh, number two here describe our spiritual state after we contacted Christ's salvation what are some words here that are used? <clears throat> Reconciled, justified, uh, saved. Um, notice also, let's see, I think it's interesting if you consider verse 10. Yeah, go ahead, someone had a comment? Joy. Um, yes, yes. Um, look at verse 10 as well. So if he loved us and saved us when we were enemies, as weak as we may feel, as separated from God as it may appear, after becoming a child of His, compare that to our previous state. That's what verse 10 is saying. If when we were enemies, He reconciled us, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And so, when, once we start that Christian walk, there are moments when we feel low. There are moments when we feel weak. There are moments when we struggle to, to have joy. 
to, reckon, to, to, to realize um, the, the gift that has been given. But as we compare that to our state prior to the gospel, look at how much more closer we are. Um, how can I think that God doesn't love me? Wait a second. I, I have been saved. Um, and so um, that's, that's powerful, and that can really help in times of, of difficulty, in times of opposition, in times of struggle. Uh, prayer starter, thank God for saving you through Jesus. Um, all right, let's look at the uh, what's new section. If someone could read the top there, page 49. Yes, go ahead. Just one thing before you ask too far with Yeah. sitting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're a fish lying flat right on your back. Yeah. Yes. Sometimes, going back to the thoughts of this chapter, right, the wiles and the trickery and the lies is sometimes that our race is complete this life. So I've overcome maybe this trial, or I've gotten through this period, or I've, I've struggled through this moment, and I feel as though I've come out in a way that is unblemished or safe uh, and, and successful, and so now the temptation can be that, hey, I'm done. I can, I, can, I, can, I can retire, I can sit, but the race is continual until when? Until death, until death or until Jesus returns again. And so that understanding allows us to persevere because we continue to put, it's not like, oh, I'm, ah, whoa, I got through this period. Ooh. Now I can finally just like, oh, I'm done. That is just, that was hard and now I can just be finished. Yes. Part of that I think, is, is really going to come into this next thing when you read this what's new, where uh, he actually says the devil is real. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of the big fallacies of being taught to. Yes. Right. But man, that's where this whole idea that once you're saved, it's just, uh, you're just, it's just me. Sure, sure. It's not a, bat, a daily battle. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the compartmentalization too, think of it this way, you not only struggle to compartmentalize periods and, and channels of daily life, like you said, home life, work life, spiritual life, but there's compartmentalization as well as it relates to the time periods of life. So like for example, right, hey, when I'm a youth, hey, VBS, Bible class, singing songs, worship, Jesus, learning about Jesus. But then, you know, when I get into those teenage years, now it's time again to compartmentalize. And so, you know what, teenage years, that the... So, um, yes, there's, there's, there's lots of... Yes, go ahead. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think even from a secular perspective, a lot of folks don't have an understanding or don't um, recognize a, a, secular, a, a cyclical process where you're constantly going through iterations and constantly having to, 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 to revisit and, and revamp and re-engage. It's more as a sprint. And the sprint is endured painfully because at the end of the sprint, you can then say, I'm done and I'm finished. That was brutal, but it's over. And for some people, that's what life is. Um, they think, I'm going to amass as much money as possible in a short amount of time as possible, get everything I want that's possible, and then I'm going to be able to retire and be finished and be done, and then I can look back and whatever I did in order to get there, it doesn't matter because the ends justify the means, and whew, it's over. Uh, but that, you know, that doesn't work. And spiritually speaking, that there's no way that works. Go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And and frankly, I think that's a really good thought because probably a lot of the reason for what you just described of not understanding really in terms of modern society anchors to the educational system. I mean, let me ask you a question. Prior to the modern educational system, how did education work? How was it viewed? You were brought up under your family. You were an apprentice. You learned a trade. You learned that trade so that you can, could, could continue practicing and learning that trade for the rest of your life. You continued to engage with others in the community regarding that trade. It was a life effort. And then modern society has basically taken education and said... Well, it starts when you're six in kindergarten, it ends when you're 18, and maybe when you're 22, and in some cases 26, but that's all you have to do, and then it's over. And it's not fun, and it's brutal, and no one really wants to do it, but you're forced to do it in some cases, literally forced to do it, and then you can just be done. And so maybe that's kind of seeped into our heads, and we've now, unfortunately, taken that in other areas of life, and... I mean, that's, again, that's a modern paradigm that's just been plastered onto us, and I think we've probably used that in terms of whether it be the Bible, whether it be certain areas of our life, even work life, right? Let me just get through this, and then it's over. But that's not what it means to live a <laughs> Christian life, uh, because it is who we are, and it is a continual effort and endeavor. Um, Let's just read the top here, page 49, and then bring up any other final questions or thoughts here. Um, if we can get through more, it'd be great. Top of page 49. <laughs> Yeah. 
So prior to becoming a Christian, who do we, what do we understand regarding having an enemy? First of all, do we even maybe think of us having an enemy? Probably from a secular perspective, it's someone who's done us wrong, someone who's ripped us off, someone we're in an argument with, someone who sought our harm or our hurt. And if that hasn't really happened very often or ever, maybe we don't even really recognize an enemy even existing. We just kind of live our life. And so this chapter is powerful because we're being brought to recognition and sensitivity of an enemy exists. You are under attack. You are being pursued. There is an effort, a strategic, tactical, ongoing, aggressive effort to alter your life. Prior to becoming a Christian, that isn't probably thought by most. And so that's a big change. That's a big, big deal. Uh, any thoughts before we continue on? Yeah. Uh, you'll be called a fool for that. You're not, you're not questioning. Yeah. And a lot of that is because of the Tarkin character that the devil has become. Yep. First in paintings and drawings, and in television and movies. The devil then personified into something that's uh, playful. Ridiculous, yeah. playful. Right. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a show called Lucifer. Yep. Where the devil is here on earth. Learning lessons. Yeah. Learning life lessons. And um, this is important. Uh, from the last, again, connecting to this last chapter where you have a new life. You are separated from this world. You're different than everybody else. And because of that, uh, they're going to make fun of you for thinking that there is a, there is a devil mm -hmm. that is after you. Uh, but it is absolutely true. Uh, the world wants everything to be random. Because then it's easy, you can explain away a lot of things, you can kind of do whatever you want to do. That's why evolution is so popular. But it's random. Yeah. You can do anything you want to do. Yeah. Well, here, if there's not a single point that is focused and it's planning yeah. for you, yeah. it's random, and it's much easier to yeah. ignore it. But this is a big deal. These paragraphs, these two paragraphs, three paragraphs are powerful, they're really, really important. And yeah. Everyone's Christian life, especially. Uh, a uh, new yeah. Yeah, and I think there's a couple ways too that we can react to this information. Um, the knowledge of there being an enemy, we can discount it. We can um, minimize it. Um, we can, in some cultures and in some influences that exist now more than ever before. We can embrace it. So let me give you just a, a, a thought here, because Asian culture is pushing its influence upon the West, and Asian culture takes the approach that there's the yin and there's the yang. There's the light, there's the dark. There's the good, there's the evil. And it's not that one is bad and one is, is good. It's that both are a piece of the universe and society and man's objective is to leverage both as necessary and to navigate himself through it. And by the way, that concept is also translated in Western literature and areas as well as we kind of just described. So it's really not that far off from what we're used to. But this idea that really, well, you know, sometimes, sometimes Satan's maybe my friend. Sometimes Satan is there, and that's just, hey, that's just a part of life. No. And it goes back to, in some ways, to postmodernism, this idea that there is no absolute truth. There's this idea that, hey, there's not just one particular right way to do things. And that, all of that is lies. 
All of that is an attempt to, to distract us from the reality, and to Larry's point as well, God has given us a singular point to fixate on. We don't have to sit here and say, well, uh, there's just all this chaos, and I don't really know how to understand it. No, we do know how to understand it. There is a source behind it, working to bring it about. Um, and so, here's a question. Do we recognize the reality and existence of Satan? And if we do, how sensitive are we to it? And how intentional are we to offset that influence? That alone will, in many ways, take a lifetime to contemplate and work toward, if we just thought about it that way. So there's a lot here. Um, any other final comments or thoughts? Amen. 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 Amen, brother. Amen, brother. Yeah, sure. Right. Right. And so if you think about his scope of work, his scope of work is not on the world. Why waste your time? So where is he directing his focus? Uh, so, so amen. Appreciate y'all very much. Appreciate the class. Thank you.